Tucker Carlson. The answer to the question, what happens if you lobotomize a ventriloquist doll, jam a loop tape recorder of AI-generated conspiracies up its rectum, and give it a show on Fox News? He's a distinguished political journalist, and by that I mean you can distinguish him from other political journalists because he's the one in the corner wearing a bow tie, eating his favourite flavour of Crayola, and mumbling about how jet fuel doesn't burn hot enough to turn the frogs gay. Today, we're going to take a look at the life and times of old Tuck, and give reasonable justification for my claim that he is as useful to the American political discourse as a handbrake is to a canoe. Tucker was born in 1969, nice, to an artist and a journalist. His parents divorced when he was six, after which his father married Patricia Swanson. I know what you're thinking, is that the same Patricia Swanson that is heiress to the frozen TV dinner company Swanson & Co? The same Swanson & Co that later became the notoriously American hungry man TV dinner brand? Why, yes, yes it is. It was this humble upbringing that saw him attend the prestigious boarding school St. George's at age 14. He's said to have been a self-assured conservative who dominated the room at the after-dinner debate society. If that sentence feels more like a polite way of saying that he was a posh, entitled little gobshite, that's only because it is. After graduating from Trinity College in 1991, he applied to work for the CIA but was rejected. Presumably because the I stands for intelligence and not imbecilic bowtie wearing virgin that looks like a constipated turtle doing a man impression. After a few years writing bullshit opinion pieces for various newspapers, the Tucker we all know and hate came about when he made the leap to television and co-hosted CNN's Crossfire from 2001 to 2004. Those of you that are ancient enough to remember the early 2000s will know that the show was sort of niche, not at all productive, and was cancelled after Jon Stewart's now notorious appearance in which he tore Tucker a new ring piece. See, Jon thought that the show had reduced itself to partisan hackery that swapped out nuance and responsible coverage for cheap talking points from the political extremes. Gee, can you imagine such a world? In January of 2005, CNN announced that Crossfire was cancelled. Tucker's contract was not renewed, and he managed to find a job with MSNBC hosting a primetime show called The Situation with Tucker Carlson. The situation presumably being that he was just fired and needed another sugar daddy to finance his bowtie collection. This show was more of the same bullshit, and in 2008 it was cancelled. Now, between 2006 and 2011, Tucker just kind of floated around, spewing inane bullshit about basically everything you can think of, including, but not limited to, the following. May 30th, 2006, in reference to Iraqis, he said this. Iraq is a crappy place filled with a bunch of, you know, yeah. semi-literate, primitive bearing, monkeys. Keep... He followed it up by saying, How could you salvage Iraq at this point? I don't, you know, it's beyond our control. I mean, if somehow the Iraqis decided to behave like human beings or something. But I just have zero sympathy for them or their culture, a culture where people just don't use toilet paper or forks. I mean, hey, I gotta... <laughs> Over several years, he's repeatedly made absurd claims about Barack Obama, enabling and outright propagating birther conspiracies, debating Barack's blackness because he's mixed race, implying that he wouldn't be where he was if he was white, all sorts of baseless speculation designed to undermine somebody on the basis of their race. If only there was a word for that kind of thing. September 3rd, 2008. He said, You know, white men have, you know, they've contributed some, I would say. Like creating civilization and stuff, I think they've done a pretty, I don't know, whatever. Yeah, I mean, apart from Mesopotamia, or ancient Egypt, or ancient India, or ancient China, or ancient Peru, or ancient Mesoamerica, Apart from those civilizations, then yeah, us whites totally nailed it. August 5th, 2008, Carlson said, The Congressional Black Caucus exists to blame the white man for everything. Oh. And I'm happy to say that in public because it's true. But what? he knows it's true. As you can see, he spent most of his time chatting shit about any country that doesn't normalize canned cheese and bulletproof backpacks. If he wasn't doing that, then he was attacking a black presidential candidate for not being black enough, but also for not being white enough. Now, the fact that he made half of these statements in conversation with somebody called Bubba the Love Sponge isn't lost on me, but it's also hilarious that Tucker chose to defend himself on his Fox News platform by saying, There's really not that much you can do to respond. It's pointless to try to explain how the words were spoken in jest or taken out of context 
or in any case bear no resemblance to what you actually think or would want for the country. You must pretend this is a debate about virtue and not about power. That your critics are arguing from principle and not from partisanship. What? Yes, because if there's one thing that will be very clear by the end of this video is that Tucker Carlson always argues from principled stances and doesn't engage in partisanship. Before we carry on, I want to thank today's sponsor, Private Internet Access. If you're a fan of protecting your devices and enjoying the freedom to browse without concern for your online safety, you need a VPN. A VPN, or a virtual private network, hides your IP address and protects your internet connection through an encrypted tunnel. But it doesn't stop there. Private Internet Access also allows you to access region-locked content from all over the world. See, using Netflix and Disney Plus without a VPN is kind of like buying Michael Jackson's Thriller but only being able to listen to The Lady in My Life. I mean, it's still MJ, I guess, but you can see how one might not be thrilled about it. Sorry. Allow me to illustrate the problem. Here you can see my Netflix account in the UK, and I am looking at a fresh new season of one of the greatest TV shows ever made, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. The problem is that it's not actually visible in Philadelphia, or anywhere else in America for that matter. Now, all I would need to do is open private internet access, select the UK as my location, and boom, it's as easy as that. I'd been using this VPN for months before they even reached out to me, and it's an invaluable tool for so many reasons. They even have a new feature that allows you to protect an unlimited amount of devices at the same time. If you'd like to give them a try, just go to piavpn.com forward slash just some geezer and you will receive 83% of your subscription and get four months for free. They even have a 30 day money back guarantee, so there's absolutely nothing to lose. Just click the link in the video description to get started. Thank you again to Private Internet Access. After being fired from two of the three major networks in the US, he signed for the big dogs, Fox News. He joined in 2009 and spent his time as a contributor until he got his own primetime show in 2016. If you'll remember, Bill O'Reilly was being ousted under a barrage of sexual misconduct allegations, and so apparently they were in the market for a slimy, smug, populist conservative sellout that's willing to trade his soul for a weekly glug of Rupert Murdoch's spunk. Let's take a look at a few of his greatest hits from his time at Fox fucking News. Firstly, and perhaps most egregiously, he attacked M&Ms for, uh, yeah, it says here, not making him want to masturbate. The green M&M, you will notice, is no longer wearing sexy boots. Now she's wearing sensible sneakers. The other big change is that the brown M&M has, quote, transitioned from high stilettos to lower block heels. Also less sexy. That's progress. M&Ms will not be satisfied until every last cartoon character is deeply unappealing and totally androgynous. Until the moment you wouldn't want to have a drink with any one of them. That's the goal. When you're totally turned off, we've achieved equity. They've won. So, to be clear, Tucker Carlson is genuinely angry that he can't tug it to M&M adverts because they aren't wearing fuck me boots and stilettos anymore. He's unsurprisingly attacked immigration on several occasions, making a number of arguments that would probably make Enoch Powell cringe. He said that immigration makes America poorer and dirtier. He's claimed that white supremacy is a hoax. He even became a bit of an environmentalist for a couple of minutes when he claimed that immigrants are destroying the flora at the southern border. You know what might also destroy the flora on the southern border, Tucker? building a 450 mile long, 30 foot high wall. Tucker repeatedly frames every topic he covers as a plot of the ruling class. Whether it's gun control, drug legalization, vaccines, he almost always impresses upon his audience that there are malicious and conspiratorial undertones that are driving those he disagrees with. He attacks George Soros specifically for being a Hungarian-born media mogul who wants to control the narrative in the US, despite working for Australian-born media mogul Rupert Murdoch. Gee, I wonder if there could be a difference between these two foreign-born billionaire white male media moguls that would give Tucker the impression that one is acting maliciously versus the other that would be given the benefit of the doubt. 
If only I could point to a reason that the man peddling the Great Replacement Theory might have a grievance with one over the other. You know, Tucker Carlson, the guy that referred to the Jewish Ukrainian president as a shifty, dead-eyed and rat-like persecutor of Christians. Now, there is one foreigner that Tucker is a fan of, though. Vladimir Putin. That's right, Tucker thinks Vlad isn't a bad guy, all things considered. It might be worth asking yourself, since it is getting pretty serious, what is this really about? Why do I hate Putin so much? Has Putin ever called me a racist? Well, not personally, but he has jailed and killed several politicians and journalists that ideologically opposed him. Has he threatened to get me fired for disagreeing with him? Again, not personally, but I can't stress enough just how many people he has murdered and jailed for disagreeing with him. It's funny how Tucker's argument boils down to, well, you haven't been personally affected by him, so why do you hate him? When this bullshit reasoning could be applied to literally everything else anybody ever objects to. Has Tucker personally ever had to have an abortion? Then why does he hate abortions so much? Has Tucker ever had to personally house an immigrant family? Then why does he hate migrants so much? Has Tucker ever had to slurp the scrotal sweat off Rupert Murdoch's gnarled, gristly foreskin? Actually, yeah, that one's probably true. Throughout his time at Fox, Tucker has shown a real ability to transcend the need for facts. A group of reporters for The Times completed an extensive report on Tucky's show Tucker Carlson Tonight, link in the description, that concluded after some 1100 episodes that it might well be one of the most racist and conspiratorial pieces of media that has ever existed. Honestly, I'd implore you to read it if you don't normally read articles. I can't cover it all here, but it's a fantastically thorough piece of journalism that should be much more widely regarded. If you're a fan of Tucker, firstly, thank you for trucking through this, you're a real one, but fair warning, that article does substantiate its claims with facts and evidence, so that might be a bit jarring. Nothing shows just how much Tucker lacks a spine than his ability to read anything put in front of him by the goblins at Fox News. He's cemented his legacy as the Ron Burgundy of conspiracy theories, so with that in mind, we're gonna bathe our brains in the festering shitwater of conspiracies that he's peddled. And where better to start than with the Great Replacement Theory? The Great Replacement Theory supposes that the powerful global elites, that means Jews, are trying to replace white, western populations with non-ethnically white people. If you ask Tucker, he will tell you that this is a white holocaust designed to eliminate the white Christian Americans, or legacy Americans, as he likes to call them. If you ask the Stephen Crowder types, they will tell you that it's a way for Democrats to skew voting demographics in their favour. If you ask the Jordan Peterson types, they'll begin by asking you what you mean by global, and white, and people, and and, before devolving into mad mutterings about Nietzsche and the postmodern Chinese wank factories. If, however, you ask normal human beings with functional brain cells, they'll tell you that this is a conspiracy created by ignorant and racist plebs to strike fear into the hearts of people who are, for some reason, deeply afraid of America that has less white skin. You see, it isn't about skin colour, it's about protecting our cultural norms. Also, we should fight against people who want to encourage multiculturalism because they're trying to wipe us out. And we aren't against people being able to practice their religions, but also, Christians are being purged from America by the globalist elite. See how the messages he's putting across might be conflicting a little bit? While we're on the subject of mental, anti-Semitic shit that Tucker has peddled for ratings, let's talk about Kanye West. Tucker had the pleasure of interviewing him through his most recent conspiracy theorist arc, and it really drove home just how willing Tucker was to enable anybody's right to say whatever they like, unfiltered, you know, a real free speech champion. Except for all the times that he filtered Kanye by cutting out the anti-Semitic ramblings that were too egregious even for Fox News. My kids are going to a school that teaches black kids a complicated Kwanzaa. I prefer my kids knew Hanukkah than Kwanzaa. At least it will come with some financial engineering. <laughs>
There's something quite tone-deaf about centimillionaire evangelical narcissists complaining that racial stereotypes and divisions are oppressing black people in America and blaming that on money-obsessed Jews who want to control the media. This is the same Kanye West, mind you, that believes that the pro-choice movement as it exists today is literally a black holocaust engineered to oppress black Americans. We're, we're still in the holocaust. Uh, a friend, a Jewish friend of mine said, oh, come go visit the Holocaust Museum. And my response was, let's visit our Holocaust Museum, Planned Parenthood. He's also the man that says that the CIA told Disney to kill Bambi's mum so people will buy more ice cream. What schools are doing is exactly what the CIA does with Pixar films and Disney films. They make Bambi's mom die in the beginning, right? And off that pain comes a purchase of ice cream. Off that pain comes, I need some more toys. Off that He's, how do I put this? A fucking nutter and shouldn't be taken seriously about anything at all. For those of you that don't know, on January 6th, 2021, a group of Americans made unlawful entry onto the grounds of the US Capitol building in protest to Donald Trump losing the presidential election. According to the FBI, several counts of vandalism and assault occurred as thousands descended onto the Capitol under the, let's say, encouragement of Donald Trump. Encouragement is always a much nicer word than incitement. So, people marched. They marched right up to the Capitol and decided to peacefully and patriotically assault police officers protecting the Capitol building and the members of Congress therein. While this was happening, Donald Trump was publicly pressuring his own Vice President Mike Pence and other members of Congress to reject Joe Biden's legitimate claim as the 46th President of the United States. Throughout this whole process, Tucker Carlson was all in on Trump. Publicly, at least, but we'll get to that. Now, you might be wondering, who the fuck thinks it's a good idea to run into a government building with weapons, assaulting police and hunting for members of Congress at the behest of a man who looks like he's just retired from the Wonka factory, while presented with absolutely no objective reason to believe that this stain of a man is telling you one jot of truth? Well, I'll tell you who. These twats, and this twat, and look at the state of this fucking cabbage here. Tucker now claims that the January 6th riot was actually the January 6th peaceful gathering that was hijacked and turned to violence by undercover government operatives. He says that it's obvious that this was done so Joe Biden could justify a literal war against conservative Christians. Now you can see how we're starting to circle back to the whole Great Replacement thing. He decided to speak the truth about what was happening using the somewhat counterintuitive method of fibbing. He produced a three-part documentary on the riot called Patriot Purge. Great replacement, you getting it? Okay, cool. That peddled the same conspiracy and the same lack of evidence, but this time it had dramatic music. This documentary has been widely panned as being a tone-deaf reimagining of events that have absolutely no basis in fact, but I recommend you watch it. With that being said, I want to correct the record on a few things. Firstly, he argues that the violence didn't begin because of Trump supporters, rather that undercover government operatives were sent to instigate violence and stir up the red-blooded legacy Americans. Quite the claim. His evidence? Well, he starts by interviewing a bloke called Michael Waller, who claims that he worked for some time as a professional agitator during the 80s in Russia, and he says that yeah, it's totally possible that agitators could have been there. Then they interviewed a journalist called Taylor Hansen, who says that he saw several people changing into MAGA gear before joining the riots in order to blend in. It is just a bit of a shame that he doesn't have any, like, evidence besides, trust me bro, why would I lie about it? I might speculate and ask him why he didn't take pictures of the dozens of people he saw that looked suspicious. Why didn't he record them? He's a fucking journalist, after all. I don't think I'm asking too much here. Tucker also intersperses these totally anecdotal ramblings with commentary from Darren Beatty, a right-wing journalist and former White House speechwriter who was fired in 2018 after attending a conference with a white nationalist. 
I'm sure he doesn't have an axe to grind with the establishment and is just here to report the facts. Next, Tucker claims that a DEA agent named Mark Ibrahim lost his job for merely being near the Capitol on January 6th. Both he and Mr. Ibrahim slap on their best shocked Pikachu faces while they explain how he's facing a 15-year federal prison sentence for merely being a patriot. I was apparently even more outraged about this than most MAGA nut jobs because I actually read the case file that I've linked in the description. Turns out, Mark Ibrahim was a probationary employee of the DEA. He had also given the DEA notice of his intent to resign weeks before January 6th. He was found to have driven 33 miles to attend the Capitol riots with one of his informants. He attended while off-duty and so was not acting in his capacity as a law enforcement officer. He lied to federal investigators about knowingly exposing his duty weapon and badge on the day of January 6th, despite taking several pictures explicitly exposing his gun and badge and posting them online and in WhatsApp chats. Also, he was not only near the Capitol, as Tucker suggests, but he had breached the barricades that the police erected, stop it, and entered the Capitol grounds carrying a flag with liberty or death written on it. Now, I'd like you to ask yourself, if Tucker was interested in giving a fair, balanced, and truthful account of this man's story, why did he leave out, like, the whole story? The documentary also featured former Army Captain Emily Rainey, who had served as a psychological operations officer at Fort Bragg. She basically chatted a bunch of shit about how the riots looked as though it could have been a false flag operation. Gee, thanks for your esteemed insight. Now, it's not as if I think her opinions mean nothing, but it's curious how many people feel persuaded by opinions without evidence. Funnily enough, she also said that she felt compelled to resign after her involvement in the rally was scrutinized, but she had already resigned months before traveling to the rally. Now, that got me wondering, so why did she resign? Seems like a weird thing to lie about, you know? Well, it turns out that she's no stranger to being a fucking moron. During the COVID days, she tore down restrictive tape that prevented the use of a public playground. After being led off by the police with a warning, she then tore down restrictive tape that prevented the use of a playground. After being let off with a second warning, she tore down restrictive tape that prevented the use of a playground. This time, she was charged with injury to personal property and received a letter of reprimand from her chain of command. That's what caused her to resign. Now, I'm sure Tucker's editor must have accidentally cut that content that they definitely recorded. He ended the documentary by driving home once again that he believes January 6th was being used as a pretext by the Biden administration to justify a war against conservatives. I'm sure this was absolute catnip to the, uh, legacy Americans that he's trying to appeal to. You know, the guys that look like liquid diabetes poured into Action Man costumes. Little did Tucker know, the war was just beginning. On April 24th, 2023, Tucker was fired from Fox News. It didn't take him long to make the claim that he was fired as a direct result of a lawsuit brought against Fox by Dominion Voting Systems. After months of broadcasting lies about electoral fraud in blind support to Donald Trump, the company that provided the hardware for the US presidential election, Dominion, brought a $1.6 billion defamation suit against Fox. After shocking Fox News with things Dominion referred to as evidence, Fox's lawyers realized that they were about to get absolutely rogered sans lube and agreed to pay over $787 million to settle the case. Now, there's a reason I wanted to bring this up after covering what Tucker reported about January 6th, and that's because there was a partially redacted file submitted in the lawsuit that detailed private conversations held between top personalities at Fox News. In this document, Tucker explicitly outlined just how much he hates Donald Trump, as well as explaining how the last four years of his presidency have been a complete and total failure. Here's a few of the actual messages he wrote. We are very, very close to being able to ignore Trump most nights. I truly can't wait. I hate him passionately. 
I blew up at Peter Navarro today in frustration. I actually like Peter, but I can't handle much more of this. That's the last four years. We're all pretending we've got a lot to show for it because admitting what a disaster it's been is too tough to digest. But come on, there really isn't an upside to Trump. For anyone on the fence about Tucker, this is explicit evidence that he's been reporting outright lies to his viewers for at least the last four years. He even said those last two on the same day that he spoke at a rally in support for Donald Trump. I know that I'm doing a lot of recommending in this video, but I honestly recommend you take a look at some of the highlights of these messages. They make the UK media seem quite honest in comparison. After one host reported provably false claims about election fraud based entirely on a single tweet from Trump, Fox's business news president Lauren Pettersson wrote in an email, quote, Jesus Christ, does anyone do a fucking simple Google search or read emails? It's hilarious. Deeply damaging to society, but hilarious. In the days after Tucker's shock firing, theories as to why he was let go started to spread. Some believed it was because of his increasingly far-right views and support for conspiracy theories. Some thought it was his support for white supremacists, and others thought it was the fact that he lost Fox dozens of advertisers over the years that made it harder to generate revenue. The fact that all of these are legitimate criticisms should point to just how much of a ball bag Tucker is, although it's important to note that Fox hasn't given a reason for his firing. The facts of the matter are that Tucker, along with a number of other Fox News hosts, made claims about the election being stolen. Dominion raised a defamation suit, and during discovery exposed a slew of personal communications from their executives that show that they are fully aware that they are reporting lies and deceiving their viewers. At the 11th hour, Fox struck a deal with Dominion to settle the case. We haven't been given the full picture of what the deal included, but we know that Fox paid 787.5 million US dollars, and also they have cut ties with Tucker Carlson and are immediately ending his show with no notice. After a couple of days stewing, Tucker was back, and boy, did he set the record straight. Sorry, I meant to say that he set no record straight at all, instead vaguely alluded to him being silenced for exposing the truth. You know, the truth. That thing that he didn't tell at all for at least the last four years that we now have actual evidence of. He said that mainstream media both left and right are colluding to shut down discussion, and that when honest people speak the truth calmly and without embarrassment, they become powerful. With this in mind, Tucker then established his own show on Twitter, now named Tucker on X. On it, he interviews people that he finds interesting in order to further the conversation around truth and public service that Americans need to hear. It's admirable, really. I mean, if I were in his position, I'd be doing anything I could to make myself relevant and keep those dollars rolling in. I really would be interviewing all sorts of mental cunts. It wouldn't even matter to me if, say, you were a convicted smackhead fraudster that claims to have smoked crack and had bum sex with Barack Obama. On September 6th, 2023, Tucker Carlson interviewed Larry Sinclair, a convicted smackhead fraudster that claims to have smoked crack and had bum sex with Barack Obama. I know we've covered some batshit shit so far, but for me this is truly beyond the pale. Now he's sort of on the level of Alex Jones in terms of just being totally untethered from reality. With that being said, let me put this to bed so there's no confusion. Larry Sinclair is a weird old man with a criminal record spanning over 27 years. His rap sheet includes counts of forgery, fraud, and larceny, and he's served prison sentences in Arizona, Florida, and Colorado. In over 16 years of prison time, he was disciplined 97 times for assault, intimidation, and possession of drugs. The state of Colorado alone lists 13 aliases of his, including Laya Vizcara Avila and Mohammed Gahanan. While this interview might have seemed like breaking news to most, Larry's been making these claims for over 15 years now. Indeed, when he first started peddling this particular crock of shite, he was offered $100,000 by the blog Whitehouse.com if he could pass a polygraph test. He did not pass the polygraph test and blames his failure on Barack Obama paying them to rig the test. 
It's his sheer inability to present anything credible that made the mainstream media totally ignore his existence. Dave Portnoy was apparently in Tucker's studio on the same day Larry was, and after the episode was aired, Dave tweeted, quote, Top to bottom, maybe the least trustworthy human I've ever laid eyes on. I'd say his story has a 0.0% chance of being true, and that's generous. Tucker's hinged the legitimacy of this story on the fact that Larry signed an affidavit saying this story is entirely truthful. Fair enough, I suppose. Nobody would ever lie on an affidavit. You know, apart from Larry Sinclair, who lied on a sworn affidavit in 2004, stating that he was terminally ill in an effort to get a warrant dismissed. Larry has never produced any sort of evidence that a medical professional has diagnosed him with any terminal illness. The rest of Tucker's Twitter episodes have been otherwise more of the same. He's interviewed everyone's favourite alleged sex trafficker Andrew Tate, as well as everyone's second favourite alleged sex trafficker Tristan Tate. And let's not forget the second best president of the last seven years and actual sentient Cheeto, Donald Trump. That particular interview was aired at the same time as the Republican primaries in a sort of weak, snivelling, pathetic protest by two slimy little weasels with shit haircuts. I'm sure that this was a principled stand against the party, and not because he was going to get shredded for being a presidential candidate who lost them the last election and is currently being indicted on four separate criminal cases. Namely, his involvement in inciting the January 6th riots, election interference in Georgia, withholding classified documents against the Espionage Act, and for falsifying business records to pay hush money to a porn star. I'm sure those things have nothing to do with it. But let's have a quick peek at this Trump interview in particular. For me, this is a point in which he could have really distanced himself from his Fox News persona. He could have approached this conversation with a degree of scepticism about Trump and the message that he's putting out there to Tucker's newfound audience of people who just want the truth, man. But he didn't choose to reinvent himself. He didn't call Trump out when he said that countries all over South America are emptying out their prisons and mental institutions and sending them to the US border. He didn't call out Trump when he claimed that the former Attorney General didn't investigate election fraud. The reality is that he did authorise an investigation, but they found no evidence of the election being stolen. Despite admitting in private that he despised Trump, all it took for this multi-millionaire to ditch his principles entirely and lick the boot of a criminal pervert was the promise of even more money. Let me wrap this up for you because we've all got shit to do. Tucker Carlson has made tens of millions of dollars a year by being a spineless, morally bankrupt skid mark on the boxer briefs of America. He's made a career out of being a fraud and has pushed propaganda that he himself doesn't believe, all for the sake of money. Rarely do you see a person so dishonest and so indefensibly anti-Semitic and racist that both The Guardian and The Spectator would find common ground in denouncing them. After all of these years and all of those bow ties, Jon Stewart's criticism of Tucker still rings true. He really is a dick. He really is a partisan hack that is hurting America. And we do well to remember that this man is simply not telling you the truth. He has never told you the truth, and if you're expecting him to begin telling you the truth, then I need you to go and check your emails, because there's a Nigerian prince that needs your help. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please do consider pressing like, it really helps. Subscribe if you want to see more, and thank you to my gorgeous and beautiful patrons. Marie, Alex Davies, Alex Ray, Alexis Geddes, Craig Hall, Fluffy the Demon, Destroyer of Worlds, Nice, Jeffrey Anderson, Jacqueline Cowan, Lord Kitty Cat, Matthew Gray, Oleg Vodolashki, Paul Ashworth, Rory McElhone, Shkl Shuttermask, Simon Watton, Birgit, and Dom Fay Leith. If you'd like to support, you can do so from just £1 a month. The link is in the description. Love you. Bye bye. If you'd like to support me on Patreon, you can do so from just £1 a month. The link is in the description. Fuck, sorry. Jesus.